Welcome to Geography 485-585L, Internet Mapping. Module 5.2, Developing and Hosting Open Geospatial Consortium Services, OGC Services and Styling in GeoServer, Part 1. This week we continue our discussion of working with GeoServer with a specific emphasis on styling within GeoServer using styled layer descriptors, a standard out of the Open Geospatial Consortium, with a focus particularly on the creation and management of styles in GeoServer and looking at what those styles look like as they're defined as styled layer descriptors. OGC Styled Layer Descriptors, or SLDs, are an open standard that are used for the definition of symbolization that can be defined both on the server side, as is used in GeoServer, but also in some instances, depending upon the capabilities of an OGC server, users may also define SLDs and submit them with OGC requests in order to request specific styling of data to be delivered to the client. Most but not all of the Open Geospatial Consortium styled layer descriptor standard has been implemented within GeoServer. With specific deviations from the implementation noted in the documentation for the OGC uh, reference documentation. So the information presented here and some of the examples are based upon the SLD reference that is included in the HTML documentation for GeoServer version 2.1. Um, and more specifically, some of the first simple examples provided as a part of the styled layer descriptor cookbook also provided within the GeoServer documentation with the links to each of these references uh, provided on the slide. So when defining styles, you are essentially creating an XML document that conforms to the SLD standard. And that document consists of four major components. The first of which are symbolizers that define the rendering style of specific geometry or content types, where those content types may be one of five kinds, points, lines, polygons, rasters, or text, where more detailed information about these symbolizers in the, in the uh, Ge GeoServer documentation may be found at the links associated with each of these symbolizer types on the slide. Additional information that may be included in an SLD include a specification for labeling, specifically defining the placement of labels within a rendered map image, filters for modifying the actual features themselves as they will be uh, delivered as a part of the map image and also for determining to which features a particular style definition would be applied and also scale elements that allow you to define alternative symbolizers for different map scales allowing for some very sophisticated um, visualizations of map data from a single layer depending upon the map scale at which that particular layer is being rendered. In our discussions of and pre presentation of examples of styled layer descriptors, I will not be showing complete styled layer descriptors but only showing the portions of the SLD that really pertain to the particular um, renderers that are, that are being described. So one thing to keep in mind 
is that in addition to the specific styles that we will be looking at on the subsequent slides in this presentation, a complete styled layer descriptor also includes a block of header XML content, as you can see here, and then one or more named layer elements, each of which will have a set of styles defined within it, and then a closing styled layer descriptor tag. This is what you would consider a complete SLD, which is illustrated in this sample file here, where you can see the header information here in the top, Then you can see the block associated with a named layer. And then the closing styled layer descriptor tag at the bottom. Again, as we look at the examples for the rest of the presentation, we will be concentrating only on the named layer section of the style definition assuming that the header and closing styled layer descriptor are required to produce a complete SLD file. Let's look at a few example points uh, or styles so that you can get a sense of what these styles look like as they are embedded within a complete styled layer descriptor. In each of these cases, we will be showing a named layer component from a complete styled layer descriptor XML document with a link provided on each slide that actually uh, allows you to access and view the full and complete styled layer descriptor that corresponds to the snippet that we're concentrating on as a part of the presentation. In this instance, we're looking at a very simple point style styled layer descriptor. As GeoServer might use this SLD to provide a very simple display of point features in response to a WMS request. So you can see the first thing that we have is this named layer element that is the container for the rest of the user defined style and information about that style. So within the named layer, we now have a name that is assigned to this particular named layer, and then a block that represents the user style. And this is really where the bulk of the styled layer descriptor content goes in terms of focusing on how you want to render individual features within the layer that this style is being applied to. So within the user style block, you then have a number of potential elements. The first is a title, where you can add a descriptive title to the style that may be used by client interfaces that can read the style and label it accordingly within their interface. The style itself is defined within the feature type style block right here. Within that feature type style, you can have one or more rules that define the style. In this case, with our simple point style, we have a single rule element that contains a single point symbolizer. So, as I mentioned earlier, you can have symbolizers associated with different types of features, points, polygons, lines, or non-feature-based raster-based data. In this case, since this is a point data set, we're going to define a point symbolizer. And for that point symbolizer, we're going to define a graphic that will be used to represent each point for a layer that this style will be applied to. And in particular, 
we will be using a defined mark that is, in this case, based on a named marker type, a circle, with an additional characteristic defined in terms of the color of the fill for that circle. Where you can see here that the, that fill is defined using a CSS parameter element with a name of fill and then a color definition for the color that should be used to fill that circle. Also as a part of the definition of this graphic element is a size element describing what the size of that particular symbol should be where that size is specified in pixels. And that is all that we have defined in terms of the specification for this point symbolizer. So the rest of the style sheet here closes the graphic element, closes the point symbolizer element, closes the rule, then feature type style, user style, and finally named layer element. And you can see what this looks like in the lower right hand corner of the slide, where each point in this sample data set is represented by a circle filled with color red that is six pixels in size. Very straightforward. If we look at the next example, here we're defining a very simple line style for a source data set. Where again, we have a link to the full styled layer descriptor on this page so you can see the full document and experiment with it yourself, including the header and the closing um, tag. Here we're again just fo focusing on the snippet for the named layer element right here, where we've given a name to this style of simple line. And then we start to define the user style block, where the title of this user style is just SLD cookbook simple line, as this has been uh, extracted from the GeoServer SLD cookbook. And then we start to define the style itself with this feature type style that contains, in this case, one rule consisting of a line symbolizer and one definition within that line symbolizer in this case, the definition of the stroke for that line. In this case, that stroke consists of two different characteristics. The first is the stroke color itself, which is in this case is just named stroke, and then the stroke width specified here in the number of pixels. Those are the only two settings that we're defining for this particular style. And the rest of our tags are just closing the hierarchy of elements that we've created as a part of this SLD file. So these are just all of the closing tags here. And you can see in the lower right hand corner of the slide what this simply styled line layer looks like, where each line is rendered in black as three pixels wide. The styling of polygons is also a fairly straightforward process and builds upon
the styles that can be defined for lines in particular. And we will see that in a moment when we discuss the relationships between the SLD components for the different uh, types of, of features. But here, again, with a link to the full styled layer descriptor provided with the link on this slide, we are viewing a snippet for a styled layer descriptor for a simple polygon representation that begins again with this named layer element that we've given a name to in terms of the um, the layer that we want to be able to use to refer refer to. Then the beginning of the definition of our user style. The in this case again the simple style that we're defining with a particular title again and as this came from the SLD cookbook and GeoServer site, the title for this style is just SLD cookbook, simple polygon. And then we have the beginning of the feature type style itself, which in this instance contains a single rule that consists of a single polygon symbolizer element where in this case, we are only defining a fill element for this polygon symbolizer. Where here, for that fill element, we are providing a simple color definition, which in this case is using this, again, the CSS parameter with a name of fill and specifying the color which in this case is a shade of blue as the color that should be used as the fill for this polygon. And as with the previous styles that we looked at, the remaining elements are just the closing tags for the hierarchy of XML elements that we've defined for this SLD. In the lower right hand corner, you can see what this style produces in terms of a very simple styled polygon layer, which though it's faint, you can actually see the very uh, light outlines of the individual polygons within this layer. But due to the uh, shrinkage of the image for display on the slide, those uh, faint lines demarcating the individual polygons within this layer um, are somewhat disappear. Our final sort of simple simple style example is for raster data, where as with the others, we have a link to a full SLD that you can look at but we're concentrating here on a snippet that again begins with a named layer element that has been given a name of two color gradient in this case. We then have the opening element of our user style to which a title of SLD cookbook two color gradient has been applied. And then we begin the definition of our feature type style itself, which in this instance, again, only contains a single rule consisting of a raster symbolizer for which we have defined a color map. We will see some very simple examples of raster symbolizers this week and we'll go into more depth in raster symbolizers in next week's class. But this is just a very simple illustration of a raster symbolizer here. Where in this case, we have a color map raster symbolizer where we are specifying two colors, each of which are associated with a particular value 
represented by the quantity value for that color map entry. And then the color that is assigned to that value. In the absence of a more detailed definition of the color map, in terms of the type of color map that we want to generate, this very simple representation will generate an automatic color gradient between the specified quantities. So in this case, we have our two color map entries, one associated with a quantity of 70, the other associated with a quantity of 256, where GeoServer will then calculate a color gradient between the two colors that are assigned to each of those quantities and use that color gradient to generate the representation of that particular raster. The rest of the style sheet that we are seeing here, as with the others, is simply the closing tags for each of the SLD elements that has contributed to the definition of this particular style. And you can see in the lower right hand corner of the slide what this simply styled raster layer looks like, where you can see that smooth color gradient that has been created by GeoServer based upon the definition of the styled layer descriptor where the endpoints of that gradient are defined in the SLD and GeoServer then generates the appropriate intermediate colors for the entire color gradient. If we step back to look at what the options are for each of the four symbolizers that we've just seen examples of, we can look at the full set of options for each of those symbolizers, where all of this is documented thoroughly and in much more detail with examples in the previously linked SLD cookbook and reference materials on the GeoServer documentation site. Starting with the point symbolizer, you have basically the definition of a graphic that is going to be associated with each point in a particular map rendering, where that graphic may be defined in one of two ways. It may be defined through reference to an online resource. So if you did not want to use a simple geometric shape that is a well-known and previously de defined shape like a circle or a square, you could actually have an online graphic that you can use as the online resource in an external graphic element in defining a point symbolizer. If you are going to use an external graphic, the online resource element is required. The other option for defining a point symbolizer is to provide a mark element, where you are required to provide a well-known name for that mark, again with those well-known names uh, provided in the documentation and built into the SLD standard. For each of those well-known named mark types, you then can optionally provide additional information about any fill that should be used in terms of color, um, this, any stroke that should be used representing the boundaries or edges of that marker, the opacity of the marker in terms of the degree of op how opaque or transparent it should be, the size of the marker in pixels, and whether or not that marker should be rotated in some way or another uh, relative to its default orientation. Next, 
we can talk about the line symbolizer that starts with two elements that you can um, refer to that actually make use of the graphic element that we just finished discussing for the point symbolizer, where for each line, you can actually define a fill for that line and a stroke for that line, where each of the options for the graphic that we were just talking about can be set for the graphic fill or graphic stroke uh, attributes of a line symbolizer. So essentially with this, you could possibly create a linear feature that is represented by say a collection of points uh, of a particular size and color and transparency as defined by a graphic element and its content. You can also make reference to and modify the characteristics of a particular line as it's represented in a map image through the use of the CSS parameter element where the CSS parameter has a name and then a type so that is used to set the values for a more simplified line. So that name element or attribute can be set to one of seven values. Stroke for, for setting the color of the, of the line. Stroke width defining the width of the line in pixels. Stroke opacity, defining the degree of transparency or opaqueness. Stroke line join and line cap, defining the endpoints and how the lines meet up with each other as they intersect with each other. And then stroke dash array and dash offset that allow you to define uh, specifications for uh, dashed lines and what can be potentially complex definitions of dashed lines to achieve effects of simple dashed lines or even more complex uh, representations like uh, crossed lines like a railroad track. Each of these is a CSS parameter element but with the attribute set to one of these seven values. The polygon symbolizer, as with the line symbolizer, builds upon the primitives defined for either the graphic or stroke as a part of the point or line symbolizers we've just discussed, and also defines a couple of additional CSS parameter values that can be applied to polygons. So first, you can define a graphic fill for a polygon where essentially that polygon would then be filled with repeated elements defined by the graphic specification where that graphic is defined using the same syntax and content that you would use for a point symbolizer. So basically, if you can define a point symbolizer for individual points, you can fill a polygon with repeated points using the same symbolizer. You can define the stroke for a polygon, which essentially defines how the outer edges or boundaries of that polygon would be rendered using the same stroke definition as you have for the line symbolizer using the same approach and model for styling the stroke of a linear feature, this time with those lines forming the boundaries of a polygon. Finally, as a part of your polygon symbolizer, you can 
define two additional CSS parameter values, one for fill and another for fill opacity, where the fill defines the color that the polygon would be filled with, and fill opacity defines the degree of transparency for that fill, so that you may actually be able to have a partially transparent polygon through which you could see other um, features or objects that might be in the background. Raster symbolizers are somewhat different from the previous feature-based symbolizers that we've talked about, as rasters represent a fundamentally different data model where the symbolizer for rasters focuses on more characteristics of the raster as a whole and how the individual pixel values within that raster might be rendered. So as we talk about how we can style rasters, we can first look at opacity, where we can define opacity at the level of the entire raster, defining whether or not that entire raster image would be some degree of transparent or opaque. We can also set the color map for a raster, where we can set the type to one of three values of ramp, values, or intervals, where the default type is ramp. So if you do not specify a type for a color map, it will default to the ramp type, which is what we just saw in our earlier sample, where the colors are interpolated between the specified color map entries. You can also, for a color map, define whether or not the colors themselves are derived from a short list of colors, in which case, this extended attribute would be set to false, which is the default. So if you do not define the extended attribute, the color ramp will automatically come from a palette of 255 colors. If you set extended to true, you will actually have a much larger palette of over 65,000 colors providing a more gradual gradient, but also a larger map image file as the color depth for that image is larger, therefore using more uh, essentially storage to handle all of the colors that might be um, uh, embedded within the map image. Within each color map, you then have a number of color map entries which include, at the very least, a color and a quantity, as we saw in the previous example, where you might also provide an optional label and opacity value for that particular color map entry. The labels that are provided are actually used when GeoServer is asked to provide a map legend for a particular layer. So if you want to be able to support that capability, you should provide labels for your um, individual types. And then you can use the opacity at, to define at the level of particular values whether or not uh, pixels should be transparent or opaque or at some uh, interval in between. When dealing with raster data, you may be working with source data that represent multiple channels, essentially multiple raster values within a single data set. In some cases, the default values, say for a three channel image, an image that is by default encoded using say red, green, or blue, you don't have to provide information about which channels in the image should be used 
to correspond with the red, green, and blue channels that GeoServer would use to render a particular image. But if you need to, you can use the channel selection element and the components within that in terms of defining the specific source channel from the data set that would correspond to each of the three channels that are used in rendering red, green, and blue. Or if you want to essentially render a grayscale image, what single source channel would be used to render that gray, gray channel? So either way, the channel selection element allows you to specify which out of multiple channels within a source data set, which channels correspond to the, indiv the individual channels, channels that are used in rendering the raster in an image. There is an additional symbolizer option called can contrast enhancement, where you can have an automatic algorithm applied to actually um, modify the distribution of values as they're mapped to the colors that are presented in the map image. The contrast enhancement element also has a number of options in terms of normalization or histogram or gamma that provide different types of modification of increasing essentially the contrast within an image to match the range of colors that are available for a particular um, visual representation. I invite you to review the documentation on the GeoServer uh, documentation site for more information about this particular option. There are three additional symbolizer components that are defined within the SLD specification that are not yet implemented in GeoServer. And those include shaded relief, the ability to essentially render shaded relief um, as a part of an image that is generated, overlap behavior and image outline, which are also um, essentially definitions of how the uh, raster should be rendered when combined with other rasters or how uh, the outline of individual image elements should be displayed within a particular rendered map. Again, in the case of GeoServer, these three additional SLD um, elements are not currently supported. Let's now look at the concept of filters as they relate to styled layer descriptors because as we've seen so far the different styled layer uh, symbolizers that we can use provide a lot of power for being able to have a high level of control over the rendering of features and rasters. Filters provide an additional level of control by allowing you to define styles really at the level of subsets of features, where filters define what subsets of features those styles would apply to. When we're defining filter rules for vector data, we have a number of options for building those filter rules. First, we need to define filters based upon attribute values. So in this case, we would be selecting a particular property of a vector data set and comparing the value of that property to some defined value. So when defining a filter based upon attribute values, there are seven options for the type of comparisons to be done. First is testing for exact equality with the property is equal to element. 
You can also test for exact inequality where property is not equal to. You can also test for greater than or less than uh, where the property is less than or less than or equal to a specified value or greater than or greater than or equal to a specified value. And finally, whether or not a particular property or attribute is between two specified values. So each one of these comparisons would result in essentially a true or false value for each feature in a particular layer. And depending upon whether or not that comparison produces a true or false value, the uh, associated style will or will not be applied. More complex comparisons can be generated using additional logical filters that allow you to combine multiple basic filters together to combine what is essentially a multiple filter that would take the result of two or more of the property comparisons and combine them and determine if both are true or both are false or other logical comparisons. So in the case of a logical filter where we're using the and, we could say property is less than say 100 or property is greater than 200. So this would be the opposite of the single comparison of property is between where we instead want to only identify those features that are less than a particular value or greater than a particular value. These logical filters can again contribute to a, a tremendous amount of flexibility in defining filters for uh, identifying the features that will to which a particular style will be applied. Spatial filters can also be defined where you can essentially define a particular geographic uh, characteristic that you want to determine if the individual features relate to that geographic characteristic in terms of intersection or equivalence, whether they're contained within or overlap or cross or other, other ge geographic or spatial compar um, comparisons. And finally, you can do scale-based selection where you can define a maximum and minimum scale denominator that can also be used to determine whether or not a particular style or set of features will be displayed. In the context of our discussion this week, we will be concentrating on the very basic attribute filters and scale-based selection. Starting with the attribute filter example, you must know two things. You need to first know the name of the attribute that you want to use in the comparison, and then you need to know the value or values for that attribute that you want to use in the comparison. So a key question arises in how do you determine the attribute name and associated values? There are a number of approaches to doing this, and depending upon the information you have and the tools that you have at hand, you can obtain some or all of this information. First off, both the attribute names and the values may be available through the documentation or metadata that are available from the data provider where the data came from. If that's the case, and you can obtain the attribute names and the range of values or the individual values from the metadata, you're good to go. 
In GeoServer, you can actually view a list of the attribute names by opening up a layer in the layer viewer and looking at the data tab for the layer information and at the bottom of the screen of information under the data tab there's a feature type details area that provides a listing of all of the attribute names associated with that particular layer but unfortunately GeoServer does not provide you information about the actual values for that attribute. It only provides you the information about the field names themselves. For vector data, you can actually access both the attribute names and their values using the OGR info command, the command that you've been using for a while now to acquire additional information in terms of coordinate reference system and other knowledge about vector data sets for the class and the various lab and homework assignments. You have an example of an OGR info command here that uses some of the options for OGR info that you might not have previously encountered where the options are dash fields equals yes meaning we would like to see the information from, the, uh, from and about the fields associated with each feature in the data set. And then dash geom equals no, meaning we do not want to see the actual geometry information for each of the features in the data set. Where, as you might recall, the default behavior of OGR info, unless you provide an option that suppresses it, is to display both the fields and the geometries where the geometries consist of all of the nodes that can, uh, contribute to either the points, lines, or polygons within that, that data set. Where, and also where those geometries can be quite verbose and distracting in terms of the volume of data that is being presented. In the instance where you only want to look at the field names and their values, this pair of options will allow you to see the fields and their values, but not clutter up that display with the list of the geometries and all of the nodes associated with those geometries. As we look at an example for the definition of an attribute filter, you can see here a map image that results from the definition of a styled layer descriptor that uses attribute filters. The link at the bottom of this page in the presentation provides access to the full styled layer descriptor that is the foundation for the style that is applied to this particular example. And the other thing that you'll want to notice, and you'll see this again during the demonstration, is that I've been able to expand the information area at the top of the open layers layer preview by clicking on the small icon at the upper left hand corner of the map area that looks like a set of dots and long dashes, where that brings up some options associated with the map preview that we're looking at where in this case we can then under the styles option ab at the above the map choose one of the available styles for this particular data set for previewing the data so the thing to note here is that we it looks like we have three different types of roads represented in this map we have the interstates represented by the black lines with yellow boundaries. We have the U.S. highways represented by essentially uh, gray lines with red boundaries. And then we have New Mexico state highways represented by simple gray lines. The set of styles that were defined to create this effect are using attribute filters to select 
individual types of roads and define styles for those roads. Let's look now at those individual style elements and how the attribute filters are applied to them. For the New Mexico highways, we have our rule, as we saw in our other styles, in our simple examples where the rule contained a particular style definition. One additional element that you can put into a rule is a filter condition. So in our earlier examples, we only saw the symbolizers and the title. We have now added a filter condition to our rule to define more specifically the set of features to which this style should be applied. Any features that do not match this definition will not be rendered. This is an important thing to think about. If you have defined a rule and a filter associated with that rule, only the features where that rule is true or where that filter is true will have the style applied to it. So in this case, we've defined our filter element and we're using, in this case, the property is equal to comparison to do our attribute comparison. That property is equal to element then has two required values that go into it. The first is the OGC property name element where here we provide the name of the attribute that we want to use in this comparison. So in this case, I did my OGR info command and obtained a list of all of the attributes for this data set and know that one of the attributes is named type. And furthermore, I know that that type attribute or field contains a number of values, one of which is state highway. So here I'm saying that I want the property name type to be equal to a literal value of state highway, where the OGC literal element is just a container for the value that that type is going to be compared to. And you will see that again and again when you are specifying a particular value, there is an OGC literal element that is wrapped around that value that you're providing. So again, here, as we're defining our filter, we have a simple filter where we are saying, we want to test whether a property is equal to, where the property is type, and we're testing to see whether it is equal to the value of state highway. So a comparison of each feature's type to that string state highway is made, and this particular rule is only going to be applied to those features where type equals state highway. No other features will be rendered using this particular rule. We then have our line symbolizer that is a definition of both the stroke and the stroke width for the overall stroke in terms of a color and a stroke width. And that is a relatively straightforward line symbolizer where we are defining the stroke and its color and width.
looking at the U.S. highways, we have a simpler, uh, a similar pattern where we have defined an additional rule where that rule is given a different title, in this case, U.S. highways. We are again defining a filter element and doing another test for equivalence where, again, our property name is type. So that is the property that we want to compare to some value, where that value in this case is U.S. Highway. So as with our previous New Mexico Highways definition, only those features that have a type equal to a value of U.S. Highway will have this rule applied to it. For each of those features where this type equals U.S. Highway is true, we then have, in this case, two line symbolizers, one shown here and one shown on the next slide, where we can actually build up a composite representation. And this is an interesting thing to keep in mind in terms of being able to have a combined representation to provide a different sort of effect for a particular um, map representation. So in this case, our first line symbolizer is defined here with a stroke color of essentially red. You can see that's the element here, CSS parameter name equals stroke, and then this literal value with a color definition. And then we're defining the stroke width here as three pixels in width. So with this alone, we would have a three pixel wide red line for the US highways. But we're not quite done defining the rule for U.S. highways. If we move to the next slide, we can see we have an additional line symbolizer, another definition of a stroke, where in this case, we're defining a stroke with a color of gray. That's what this color represents right here. With a stroke width, of one pixel. This creates the effect of a one pixel wide line being superimposed on a three pixel wide line, which as you might imagine, produces the visual effect of a filled line where the fill is gray in this case and the edges of the line are red as the gray one pixel wide line covers the middle pixel of the three pixel wide red linear symbolizer. The order of your line symbolizers is important here because if you had reversed them, then the three pixel wide line would totally obscure the one pixel line. But this is a very simple example of how you can use multiple line symbolizers to build a composite representation for a particular set of features. In this case, the features of type U.S. highways. Our model for the interstates is exactly the same, where we are defining a rule where as a part of that rule, we're defining a filter where we're doing another test of equivalence, property is equal to, where the property name is type, and the value that that property is being compared to is interstate. So this rule will only be applied to features where the type property is equal to interstate. 
for those features, we then have a pair of line symbolizers defined where the first one consists of this stroke where the color is defined right here and the width is defined right here as a, having a width of five pixels. We now have a second line symbolizer where the stroke color is defined as gray and the stroke width as three pixels, where just as with our US highways example, our interstates are going to be rendered as essentially a yellow background with a dark gray foreground along that's aligned along the center of that yellow background, creating the visual effect of a dark gray road with yellow edges. Another method for being able to modify what features are rendered and what features are used in the application of a particular style is the integration of a scale factor into the SLD, where a scale factor is an additional selector that may be used uh, as a complement to an attribute filter, which is what we're going to be doing here. A scale factor, a scale selector can actually be used independent of an attribute filter as well. So if you just want to have all of the features associated with a particular layer only appear at a particular scale, you can choose that as well. But in this case, we are combining our attribute filters with a scale fa factor to further modify the display of our different road types. Whereas with our other examples, the full styled layer descriptor is accessed from the link on the slide here. As we look at the impact of the styled layer descriptors and scale selectors that we are going to be using, we can see the outcomes of viewing this particular map at different scales, as these are screenshots from the open layers layer preview from within GeoServer with the additional more detailed controls expanded at the top of the open layers interface. Here we can see at a scale of one to nine million, we are only seeing the interstate features. And you can note the scale down in the lower left-hand corner of the screen image. As we zoom in to a scale of one to two million, we now are also seeing the US highways. So we have crossed a scale boundary that is defined for the state highways. So now they are being rendered as well. Finally, as we zoom in further, in this case to a scale of one to 586,000, we now also are seeing the New Mexico state highways, here represented by the gray lines. Each one of these is a particular map scale that is presented as, as a, an option to the user where the GeoServer itself interprets the combination of the map area that is being requested, makes an assumption about the screen resolution that is being viewed to then determine whether or not a particular feature should be rendered based upon the scale settings for that feature, 
and also the uh, assumed map scale that is currently being applied. If we look at the styled layer descriptor that corresponds with this, it is almost exactly the same as the previous SLD that we're looking at with one difference where, for example, for here for the New Mexico highways, we have the same rule. We have the same filter condition defined here. The only thing we have added is a max scale denominator element that is set to a value of 1 million. What this is saying that this particular rule should only be applied when the scale denominator is less than 1 million. So as you might recall, this New, New Mexico Highways set of features did not appear until we were actually viewing it at 1 to 500 and something odd thousand um, scale. It did not appear at our 1 to 2 million or 1 to 9 million scale. That's because of this max scale denominator setting that has been added to the definition of this rule. A similar setting has been applied to the U.S. highways, where the SLD is exactly the same as in our previous example, except again for the addition of a max scale denominator, in this case set to 5 million, meaning that this rule should only be applied when the request map scale is less than 5 million. Yielding the result that we saw in the screen grabs, where at a scale of 1 to 9 million, the U.S. highways were not displayed, but when we had zoomed in to a scale of 1 to 2 million, they did appear. That is controlled simply by this max scale denominator element that has been added to the styled layer descriptor for this particular um, layer. And the, the second uh, line symbolizer as a continuation of that U.S. highways is not modified at all. Finally, the interstates rule has not been modified in any way, as in this case, we want the interstates to be visible at all scales. So this is exactly the same as the original attribute filter that we uh, demonstrated in the previous example. With that overview, let's now go through a basic demonstration of how you work with styles within the GeoServer interface. In this case, the particular browser that you're working in can have an impact on your uh, experience in working with the style editor and tools within GeoServer. The current version of both Safari and Chrome on the Macintosh do not properly display the contents of the style editor within GeoServer. So this particular demonstration is being provided using Firefox. This is just something to keep in mind is if you see um, if a display that does not make a lot of sense in terms of the style editor, you may want to try interacting with GeoServer using a different browser to see if that works better for you. Here we have the GeoServer interface. I've already logged in uh, with, my, uh, with my account. And we're going to be, in this case, working with two particular areas within the interface. First, in the styles area, 
And then also in the layers area where we can then attach additional styles to particular uh, layers. And then we will preview those, those uh, the effects of those styles in the layer preview tool. Let's start then with styles. GeoServer comes with a number of default styles and then you can add your own custom styles to GeoServer. In preparation for last week's and this week's class, I have created three custom styles already. One that was used in the display of last week's raster layers, and two that demonstrate the uh, feature uh, attribute selectors and also the scaling effects that we just finished discussing. We will talk more about the raster styling next week, but right now we will concentrate on looking at and working with the vector styles and the style editing and and updating capabilities within GeoServer. So let's start looking at an existing style and the interface for examining styles. So in this case, I can click on an existing style. This is the simple roads uh, style that uh, basically has my attribute selectors for the three road types and the associated styles. You can see in the style editor the name of the style here and an option to actually copy content from an existing style if you wanted to completely overwrite this with something else. In this case, we will not do that. Instead, we will look at the style as it is presented here in the editor. And again, depending on your browser and its support for the type of display that's being provided in the editor, you may or may not see the structured text that you're seeing here. So this is the entire SLD that includes all of those defined rules for each of the three road types, the XML, document type definition at the top and the other header information and the closing styled layer descriptor element at the bottom. So this is a complete SLD file. If you were to just go in and edit this, after you had edited it or after you import or modify an existing file, you should always validate the modified file using this validate button. When you click on that, if you scroll back to the top of the window, you will see an, a message that either indicates that there were no validation errors or it will indicate that there were errors and where those errors were found so that you can try to then modify the style that you've created, revalidate it, and hope that it will eventually pass the validation that GeoServer does. Once your style is validated, you can then submit it, where that essentially writes your changes to that named style within GeoServer so that it can then be used by others. Until you submit your style, it is not stored within GeoServer. So if I made a lot of changes to this style that I opened up, but did not press submit, none of those changes would be actually saved within GeoServer. If you don't want to modify an SLD, but you're afraid you might have by just viewing it here, you can also choose the cancel button where you can then cancel your interactions with this and it'll take you back to the list of styles. So in this case, I hit the cancel button. I'm back to my list of style names. 
To add a new style, I simply click the Add a New Style button at the top of the screen, where this brings up the same interface, but with no content in the current editor window. So I could then name this And then I have a couple of options. I can copy an existing style to use as essentially the foundation for what I'm working with. So maybe I wanted to use my simple road style as the foundation. Once I've selected it, I can choose this copy button here where it then reads that style into the editor window where I can then start editing it. Otherwise, if I have an SLD file that I've created on my local hard drive, I can then browse to that using this button down here. And hit the upload button. And that file that I uploaded from my local hard drive is then put into the editing editor window where I can then um, either modify it or save it. In this case, when I uploaded the file, it automatically renamed the uh, the file that the the name that's going to be applied to this new style. So I want to make sure to remember to name it back to what I wanted originally so I don't accidentally overwrite a, a previously written style. So with this, I have a new style or a modified style that I can then edit or just save. Remember, always validate. I can scroll back to the top and see that there were no validation errors. And I can then submit it. Now just for an example, if I for exa if if I had done something bad to this style, say I had accidentally deleted one of the elements and I chose to validate, I would then see an error at the top of the window that has something indicating where and what type of element or error was generated. So this is the information you can try to use to reverse the problem that has been introduced through either a, a bad modification or um, a badly coded style sheet to begin with. Until you, until you can validate your style, you should not submit it for long-term storage within the system. In this case, I'm just going to cancel and go back to my styles. So as I said, I have created a number of custom styles that I can then use for any layers that are defined in GeoServer. So you don't necessarily have to have a one-to-one -one correspondence between a layer and a particular style. You can define styles and reuse them for more than one layer. Keeping in mind that if you're defining a style that is, for example, doing attribute filtering, the attributes and attributes names have to be the same. Otherwise, it's going to be an invalid application of the style and you may see no features because there's no element, say, named typed, named type, that would be used in those attribute filters. So let's look at a layer that we can apply one or more styles to. So if I click on layers, and I can go, in this case, to my existing GPS roads layer. This is actually the layer that I used and that I tested using OGR info to get the um, field name and the set of values that I use for defining this style so that I know, in this case, 
that the attributes in the GPS roads layer match the rules that I set up in my style. So if I click on the layer for the GPS roads, and then I click on the publishing tab in the layer editor window, we can scroll down under the WMS settings and choose one or more styles to associate with this particular layer. And we can do that in two ways. We can first define a default style, which in this case is set to a simple linear style, a line style. But I can also link other styles to this same layer so that those styles are available if you want to request them by name. You can also, in this case, if, if I know that I want to use a particular uh, style as the default, I might change this line to my KKB scaled roads. This is the style that is doing both the um, attribute filtering and scale filtering for the rendering of the uh, different road types. And you can see that it is taking the information out of that SLD in terms of both the what the features look like and their names, where those names are coming out of the SLD that I defined. And just for grins, I will add this line style over here as one of the additional styles that is available for this particular layer. As with your other interactions with GeoServer, you must remember to choose Save after you change any settings related to the layer. So if we now go to the layer preview and choose that GPS roads layer here and click on the open layers preview, we can see that I'm currently viewing at a scale of one to one million or one to nine million. And we are only seeing the interstates. I can expand the toolbar up above. And one of the nice things you can do here is within the toolbar, you can then select any of the available styles that are defined for this particular layer. So if I decided that I wanted that simple line style, I can just choose it here. Where you might remember back from when we were talking about WMS and that styles parameter, this is where that styles parameter comes into play. Where as you're defining styles and linking them to layers in GeoServer, those are styles that are advertised as part of the get capabilities request for a particular layer, and then you can specify the style name as a part of the WMS request to retrieve the map image that is rendered using the requested style. So the open layers previewer here is just doing a WMS request where it is setting that styles parameter to one of the styles that we have defined using the SLD. And we can see that up here, actually, as you can see that at the top of the, uh, you can see that the actual request is a WMS get map request that is being submitted by open layers. So if we go back to our scaled roads here, we can then zoom in and see that as we've crossed the 5 million threshold, now the, uh, the state highways are showing up. And we can continue to zoom in when we cross that 1 million threshold, we now actually see the New Mexico highways. And we can then switch back to our line and see that there are actually other road types 
that are a part of this GPS roads that aren't even showing up in our filtered rendering using the simple roads or the scaled roads, where again, you should remember that when you are defining your attribute filters, only those features that match those filters will be displayed. Since I didn't define any rules that did not have attribute filters associated with them, some of the road types, in, this, in the case of this data set, local roads, as you see the local road network for Albuquerque here on the map, not, those never show up when I'm using one of the two road styles that I defined. I could keep zooming in further and further and they those local roads do not show up until I choose a style that does not limit the display only to interstates, US highways, or New Mexico state highways. So given this, the process that you will generally need to follow is to gain an understanding of the source data for a particular layer, then define a style based upon the data that are the source for a store that you have defined and one or more layers that you have defined. So you can then create a new style by clicking on add a new style and going through the process of either copying an existing style and modifying it or importing a style from your directory on your home computer and then editing it and saving it and validating it on GeoServer. And once you have saved that style going to a layer and modifying that layer so that that style is available as one of the styles that are supported by that layer, where you may also then define a style as the default style for a layer so that if a user does not specify a named style, they will get your default style. So that completes our discussion this week on introducing SLDs and filters and scales for vector data. And next week we will discuss styling of raster data.